Hello and welcome everyone, and thank you for joining us today. It's now 12 noon Eastern time, so we will begin our session on local community response to climate change threats in the Indian Ocean world. My name is Joseph Howard, and I'll be moderating today's session. I'm a PhD candidate in history in the Indian Ocean World Center here at McGill University. My research interests include questions of race and religion in the British Empire, encounters between Eastern and Western forms of Christianity in the Eastern Indian Ocean world, and the role of environmental factors in religious conflict. My dissertation focuses on interactions between British missionaries and indigenous Christians in Ethiopia and South India in the 19th century and explores the Anglican perspectives of Orthodox Christianity. This year marks the 10th anniversary of the Indian Ocean World Center, the IOWC, as an official McGill University Research Center. The IOWC has existed since 2011 as an internationally recognized interdisciplinary hub, engaging with global partners in pioneering multidisciplinary research, notably on past to present environmental and climatic events, disease, enslavement, production and trade in the Indian Ocean world. A recent project entitled Appraising Risk, funded by the Canadian Social Sciences and Humanities Research Council, is an international collaboration of scholars and researchers dedicated to exploring the critical role of climatic crises in the past and future of the Indian Ocean world. The project includes the creation of a comprehensive spatial and temporal database of human environment interaction and interdependence during periods of climatic change. This event today is hosted by the Indian Ocean World Center and the McGill Alumni Network and is an opportunity to have a compelling discussion with a fantastic group of scholars, each based on a different continent, who will provide insight into climate related concerns affecting local communities in the Indian Ocean world. This is how the event will proceed. I will introduce the scholars and then ask them a series of questions that they will have about 10 minutes each to address. These questions will enable both insights into their backgrounds as scholars, as well as their research. After the speakers present, there will be a time for Q&A with the audience. You are all invited to submit any questions you may have for the speakers in the chat box. Uh, please direct them to Philip Gooding. And the team and I will do our best to address as many questions as possible. So let us begin by introducing today's speaker. First, we have Aisha Siddiqui. Aisha is Assistant Professor in Human Geography at the University of Cambridge. She is a development and post-colonial geographer. Her core research interests are around hazard-based disasters and their intersection with politics, security, and development in the global south. Her research explores questions of political space in the aftermath of disasters and uses a social contract framework to shed new light on the way disasters are lived and experienced on the margins of the post-colony. Prior to joining the department in January 2020, Aisha was based at the Department of Geography at Royal Holloway University of London. She has an interdisciplinary background and has done considerable work on the interface of academia and policy most recently for the UK's Houses of Parliament. Next, we'll have Everjoy Grace Chiamba, a PhD candidate at the University of Bonn. In her research, Everjoy investigates the underlying politics of information flows in the context of disaster risk reduction in Zimbabwe. The research will contribute to a better understanding of the role of different media outlets to communicate disaster risk in rural Zimbabwe and use this as a basis to assess the potential of ICTs to enhance disaster preparedness more generally. Finally, we'll hear from Dr. Julie Babin. Dr. Babin is a postdoctoral fellow at the Indian Ocean World Center at McGill University. Her research interests include Arctic geopolitics, science diplomacy, Asian Arctic policies, and Japan's foreign policy. Given the development of the Arctic Ocean caused by climate, climate change, Arctic and non-Arctic states must be ready to address climate, climate migrations, security in maritime transport and navigation, border issues, and conservation of the environment. The warming of the Arctic is already having an impact on the Central Asian monsoon system and the rainfall regime in Asia, as, as well as the movement of winds and sandstorms, 
or the release of gas and the salinity of marine currents. She is currently conducting a study on the impact of climate change for a local Asian community in South Korea, the Henyo. This local community of women sea divers have been living on the harvest of maritime resources for the past four centuries. However, recent developments, including sea warming, threaten this ancestral community. Thank you all for joining today. We'll begin today's presentation with Aisha. So my first question for you is, why do you believe we need a fundamentally different decolonial approach when examining the issue of disasters in the global south? Um, thank you very much for inviting uh, me to speak at this session and um, for giving me the opportunity to talk about relatively new ideas and research that I'm currently involved in. So um, why do I believe that we need a fundamentally um, different approach when talking about issues around hazards and, and, and uh, disasters in global societies, which includes, of course, the Indian Ocean world. Um, I am currently in, um, in Peru and I'm doing uh, research in a flood affected region um, in the North Coast. And in our interviews with people, we're finding very often that people who've been displaced by the most recent set of floods um, speak to us about two different houses. They move to a new place for safety, but they're returning to their original home daily um, or regularly uh, for their livelihoods. That's where their, their land is and, and that's where their agricultural practice is. And in some ways hearing this sounds quite strange or, or unusual that they're maintaining two houses. Um, and at the same time, for me as a researcher on disasters in, in the global South, it's also not very strange, it's, it's almost strangely normal. Where I have worked in communities in the Philippines, um, when I've worked in, in communities in, in, in Pakistan, I've often heard that people were moved either by state projects or in the aftermath of, of different kinds of hazards. Um, and yet they have to maintain their old house either because of, of kinship networks or because of, of, of communities. Um, and, and even though it's, it's quite challenging for people to go back and forth between two houses, sometimes they're, they're quite far, et cetera, um, it, it, it seems more and more um, normal because there's this very Western orientated knowledge um, that seems to suggest either, either the state or different kind of science agencies that say, okay, this place is really hazardous. We need to get people to move. And if they're not moving, then they're kind of forcibly moved. And in, in doing this, we are making people almost more vulnerable in some ways to, to the hazard than, than they would be in a, in a place where they're, they're, they have um, kind of more historical knowledge, they have better net, uh, kinship networks, etc. And so what I'm increasingly seeing evidence of that is that in some ways, this whole paradigm around disasters is failing to meet the needs of people who are most vulnerable to these hazards. Interesting. So what have been some of your findings and reflections on this issue from the field work you have done in these communities? Um, yes, and I, I feel like um, what I'm increasingly uh, beginning to, to, to question or to consider through uh, my research is that um, even some of the more kind of critical approaches uh, within uh, disaster studies are not going quite far enough in bringing um, more kind of uh, post-colonial, decolonial um, indigenous thinking into the way that we're, we're constructing and understanding um, disasters. So for example, let me speak to some field work that I've done in the Philippines. And um, if it would now be possible to pull up the slide that I that I presented, um, that I sent in. So um, this is a, a, a really kind of, um, I think, good visual example um, that I went in to do to do field work in the Philippines um, in, in the southern region of um, of Mindanao. And if you look at um, the uh, image on the left that has been generated by the Philippine um, Atmospheric Geophysical and Astronomical Services um, Administration, you'll see that the kind of um, 
existing science that we have around, um, around typhoons shows that um, the green region, uh, which is where I was doing a lot of my field work, it falls below what is considered the typhoon belt of the Philippines. So a lot of the data that we have, the kind of um, scientific, um, you know, satellite imagery and, um, um, you know, Western science dominated um, approaches to understanding typhoons, they indicate that um, this particular region where I work, it falls outside of a, a typhoon region and is and it's relatively safe. And yet, when I went in to do to do field work, um, the region had suffered two significant uh, typhoons, one after the other, um, in 2012 and and also in um, in, in 2011. And uh, in some ways. What 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 struck me is that the, that there's this region that is being touted as as typhoon free. The regional government is saying, oh, you know, uh, this is the best place for for developing uh, new resources, for doing business, etc. Because this is a typhoon free region, and here you have um, one in 2011 and, and and one in 2012 kind of subsequent typhoons. So they, they, something about this doesn't quite seem right. Um, in, in, in the way that um, we, we're, we're understanding uh, typhoons in, in, in this part of, of the Philippines. And as I begin to speak to uh, the indigenous community of the Mandaya who are on the, uh, the right uh, hand side of this, um, of this slide, um, I begin to hear about an, an architectural structure called the Thumbo Bomb, which they've also uh, drawn in in subsequent uh, storytelling workshops that that we held in in, in this particular uh, region. And they they begin to talk of um, indigenous materials that they use um, for when there are very strong winds and rains, and 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 the climate begins to resemble that of a of of, of a typhoon. And, and, and suddenly it, it becomes clear that we, we do have some kind of an architectural and material history of typhoons, even though we don't necessarily within um, the Western uh, science have an, have an understanding uh, of this or, or, or consider. Um, and and, and there's, there, there, there's something here that actually um, the, the Western records um, only go as far back as, as when the Spanish arrived in, in the Philippines. But of course, um, the, the indigenous and the, the historical knowledge that is present within, within these communities goes back much further. And, and, and so suddenly you begin to see that actually there, there is a, a much deeper, a much more um, uh, experienced understanding of, of, of typhoons and one that is, is, is going to be, is going to remain incomplete if we don't um, realize uh, or, or begin to incorporate other ways of, of knowing disasters, other ways of understanding hazards within our, our understanding of, of, of disasters um, in, in post-colonial states. I see. And what types of cross-regional similarities and differences do you see in your work? Um, I think that uh, across um, the different places uh, that I have um, uh, carried out fieldwork in, in Pakistan, in Philippines, and um, now a little bit in um, Latin America, um, working in the non-Western world, the commonality I've seen across cultures is that communities don't necessarily view hazards and, and the disasters that ensue from these hazards in the same way that state that the state and power brokers do. They, they, they might have a different kind of um, uh, lived experience perspective, et cetera, on this. And uh, that a lot of the, the dominant knowledge on, on hazards and, and dealing with disaster risk is um, not really um, or, or doesn't always resonate with the people that it's trying to um, that it's trying to protect. And here I'm ref referring uh, especially to vulnerable communities in parts of the global south who are regularly being told that extreme weather events related to climate change will make their lives more hazardous. And so, in order to prevent this hazard from from kind of really uh, impacting their lives. 
um, they're being asked, they're told by state authorities or by other people in power um, that they need to be, uh, for example, evicted from their homes in, in cities like uh, Karachi in, in, in Pakistan so that city authorities can implement better flood risk planning and other communities in um, for example, um, rural Colombia are being uh, displaced so that a large dam can make more green and more renewable energy. And uh, these communities are really kind of fighting back because they're not understanding um, uh, you know, why um, these, these are, are sacrifices that they, that, that they need to make. And they're resisting the state and they're resisting um, large institutions. Basically, everyone who's telling them that they uh, are going to be dispossessed now so that climate change doesn't dispossess them in the future. And this obviously doesn't make any sense. So rather than working with and for um, vulnerable people, um, a lot of um, what I've seen um, you know, of, of a climate agenda that's kind of imposed top down is that it is often working against them. And, and, and that, that uh, seems to be quite a common path in um, or a common thread uh, running through, through uh, the work that uh, I've done in, in these places. Thank you very much, Aisha, for your insight. Um, we'll turn to our next panelist, Everjoy Chimba. Um, so the, the first question I have for you is, how are rural communities informing themselves or being informed about weather and climate related threats? Okay, so thank you for inviting me today and uh, for the opportunity to present part of my work. Um, in the context of Chimani Mani in Zimbabwe, uh, and this is a community that is increasingly exposed to cyclones uh, as witnessed by Cyclone Idai in 2019 that left more than 600 people dead. And there are projections that more cyclones will affect the area as a result of climate change. Um, can you please show the next slide? Yeah, so this is just an overview of um, the cyclones that have affected the area um, from 2000 until today. And um, you can stop the, the slide here. Um, so when it comes to accessing information in, in this complex, it is a complex uh, situation in, in the sense that it is not only one system, but a network of other systems which operate at various levels. So on one hand, we have the traditional leadership, uh, which is made up of village heads and the chief, and they use top-down approaches. So through community meetings, the chief is the one who's overseeing everything. So the flow of information, and he is the one who determines what type of information is disseminated to the people. So if he says that uh, we need to uh, have a rainmaking ceremony, people have to abide and follow that without questions. And then we have the next layer, uh, which is through the government. So at this level, we have the district administrator um, who has the highest office in the area. Uh, and he works um, with agriculture extension offices um, who help people to understand the environmental changes and the associated threats um, and how communities can adapt. Um, so they also work with uh, school headmasters where climate change is part of the curriculum and school children take information back to the, to the families. But some participants in the area who do not have school going children also had a problem with this approach. Um, then we go to another layer where we have NGOs and they work with um, two community-based organizations in this area. So they're engaged in different climate change projects uh, and they also have disaster committees who are trained and um, to make them easily accessible to people at grassroots level. So people can go and ask uh, questions um, pertaining different aspects of climate change. So um, let's say uh, people were so used that in Zimbabwe, the planting season is uh, in October, but over the past years, it has shifted. So these are the people who can help people to understand when um, they can plant and uh, why these changes are happening. And then at a personal level, uh, and this is to a limited extent because this is a largely rural area with a different uh, challenges. Um, people have access to information through newspapers, through radio, and, and the television. Um, but 
Um, no, and not everyone has access to these. Actually, a few people have access to these um, modes of communication. Um, and the most common one is um, through informal ways. So through word of mouth where people share experiences. And there are also um, applications on mobile phones, so smartphones. Um, there is this particular app called the Eco Farmer where farmers can get weather related information, when to plant, um, and um, also through social media. So there are different WhatsApp groups. Uh, and for those who have access to Facebook, uh, where they exchange information and have discussions. Uh, and there is also a youth group um, that is engaged in theater plays on different aspects, social aspects, and including climate change issues. So these are some of the ways in which um, the people in this area are accessing uh, climate related information. I see. Uh what are the opportunities and challenges for communities to critically evaluate weather and climate related information in a changing ICT landscape? So um, there is a talk about uh, mobile phones, particularly in Africa, being widely accessible um, and being a primary channel for sharing information. But when the cyclone happened in 2019, it actually exposed gaps in rural communities um, that uh, it is not as it is written, um, it may be in, in scientific um, articles but on the ground that less people have access um, to, to um, ICT such as uh, mobile phones. And um, to give an example, more, many people I interviewed um, in, um, they say that they did uh, see the warnings or hear about the warnings uh, from their relatives who were calling, um, but they treated them as rumors and did not take action because they're used to this top-down approach um, that they get formal information through these traditional structures. So here, I think the opportunity for the government after um, this devastating cyclone um, is to incorporate social media in formal communication um, together with these traditional communication cha channels. So through, through together with the, with the chiefs, with uh, the district administrators, um, not only uh, to give information about cyclones, but on general aspects about climate change so that people understand the changes that are happening in the area and they can act fast. And another challenge is uh, on infrastructure in this community. Um, they have limited access to a mobile network. So even if you have um, your, your smartphone, um, they, in many parts, people have to walk for more than 30 minutes uh, to go to mountain tops. And they're also fixed um, network points. And then um, they're also power cuts. And together with the ailing Zimbabwe, uh, Zimbabwean economy, um, it is difficult for people to access timely information. So when I was in the field, I thought um, an opportunity is for the government to work um, with mobile operators and other experts and um, stakeholders to find ways to develop a platform where people can dial a number when they have access to network and um, get it for free, get access information for free at any time. And this may bring in confidence and acceptance if the information is coming from an official source. And then the um, other thing is literacy. In, in this area, it, um, the, the literacy rate is quite low and um, it affects understanding of certain information if it is not uh, in the local languages. So after the cyclone, the Civil Protection Unit sent text messages to uh, warn people about um, crossing flooded rivers or bridges, um, but it was in English. And many participants complained that we could not understand that. Um, so the opportunity would be to find interactive ways of communicating climate related issues, warnings um, in form of short videos, uh, port posters or music, something interactive um, so that the information is going to all ages and um, is also catering to people who have disabilities. How willing do you think people are to assimilate new information versus maintaining indigenous knowledge? Um, a fundamental challenge I um, saw in this community is the, that they struggle to understand that uh, climate change is real and is happening now and not something that is happening in the, in the future. So most of them were mainly concerned um, about their immediate needs. 
So when um, when am, am I going to plant? Uh, am I going to have enough until the next harvest? And um, I asked, um, I went into the area a year after the cyclone happened, and I asked many of the participants if they had observed any environmental changes or any climatic changes over the years. And for those who've stayed in the area for a long time, they said yes. And I continue to ask them if they're informing themselves about the changes that are happening in the area and also the threat of future cyclones. And most of them said no, because in their experience, uh, cyclones come every 10 years. And so they, they would not be prepared. They would wait until 10 years. Um, and yet uh, since 2019, um, there have been four cyclone warnings that have uh, had damaging effects um, to their lives and the livelihoods in, in this area. And I also encountered many participants who are still holding on to this old information and um, to um, traditional information and their experiences. And what I realized is that um, traditional information is fixed and it's not evolving. And that is why it is hard for um, people to accept new information, even from other sources. Um, and um, due to the political syst uh, system in Zimbabwe, there is also um, information politics. And some participants uh, say that they mistrust the, the government and do not trust each other. Um, that the government is forcing it, uh, certain adaptation strategies on them. So if you do not do um, certain, uh, implement a certain strategy, you do not get um, inputs. So credibility in information is a major challenge in this area. And um, people believe that the information is somehow biased and hence people trust and revert to the old traditional ways. So this is a major challenge in the, in the area. Thank you very much, Aberjoy. Um, now we'll turn to our, our final panelist, Dr. Julie Baba. Um, so Julie, can I ask you, uh, your research here is based on the Henyo community. Can you give a brief overview of the community? Uh, yes, thank you for your kind invitation. So uh, I'm currently working on developing a project on the adaptation of a community of women divers uh, to climatic and environmental change in South Korea. So this community, the Henyo, uh, they have been diving for centuries and living from marine resources for centuries, uh, um, using only um, cotton swimsuits to harvest uh, resources. And although now they use um, scuba and wetsuit to protect themselves from the cold of the sea, they still don't use any um, help from oxygen cylinders to uh, dive. And they stay underwater for up to five minutes. So it's really interesting how they have been living and evolving through the centuries without uh, any specific equipment to harvest marine resources. So uh, the Henio, they uh, harvest very uh, various um, sea products to survive, uh, such as the abalone, the conches, uh, shellfish, octopus, or seaweed. And those resources are really uh, vital to their um, to their uh, to their life, to their uh, household economy, but also to in their dietary uh, system. And uh, these women, they are uh, portrayed and seen in South Korea as symbols of uh, working mothers caregiver, breadwinner, and also as the spirits of the Southern Island resident in South Korea, and also as a marine cultural heritage. So they have a very important role. Also, the Henio have an incredibly honed uh, ability to understand the mul multiple facets of their environmental system and their long-standing ability to pass down the very intricate uh, traditional ecological knowledge is really interesting. Uh, to understand uh, the, um, the resources that are uh, located in South Korea. So the Henio culture, value system, and uh, social organization have led them to become ecologists before we started to, uh, to speak about ecologists. And they pay attention to sustainable management of the agrobiodiversity of the sea. So this is really fascinating. I see. Could you tell us a bit more about the how the Henyo share and use traditional knowledge in order to sustain these ecological practices? Yes, so um, the Henyo, as I said, are ecological divers who take the sea as their main area in the life world. And for the Henyo, knowledge of nature that includes uh, marine geography, changes in tidal currents, uh, marine wildlife habitats, 
and their life is really embedded in ecological value that are based on sustainable management of this agrobiodiversity that has been inherited by local and traditional knowledge system through the centuries. And through time, observation practices uh, and practices the Henio have learned about, for example, the spawning season uh, of, um, of marine resources, also the prohibition period for gathering these resources. They have noticed that uh, species provide um, nutrition and shelter to each other. And if the population of a certain species gets too large or too small, it can overload the ecological cycle and impact uh, the symbiotic circulation uh, in the sea. So based on all this, uh, their observation, the Henio have been able for centuries to estimate the progression of seasonal life cycle in, uh, of the marine organism, and they have been able to harvest uh, resources accordingly to those cycles. And they have integrated the necessity of non-harvest season, something we could really learn about, and have tried not to interfere on this cycle by setting periods for gathering sea products and also controlling, uh, controlling the fishing activity that helps to maintain uh, the cycle and um, a balance between gathering and protecting. And uh, through the, the decades, they have passed down this information from generation of divers. And along with the non-harvesting season, they also uh, strictly adhere to size limit of the harvest. For example, they will not um, harvest uh, fish uh, uh, shells if they are too small, uh, conscious if they are small, uh, smaller than seven, centi seven centimeters will not be harvested. So they have time to grow bigger and to uh, participate in the ecological cycle. And as I mentioned, for the, this community, the, um, the, the, the marine resources are really important for their dietary life and nutrition. And while they sell the best products uh, in South Korea, but now in other uh, markets in the world, they have been using the float fishes and uh, less popular marine plants for centuries to create dishes that have been the meal for Icelanders since ancient time. And that has helped them to survive through famine uh, and war. So uh, the fish, Henio fishery system has it made it possible for them to secure a livelihood, not only at a household level, but also to contribute uh, very importantly at the local economy uh, as well in South Korea. Fascinating. Uh, what are the challenges encountered by this community in regards to environmental transformation? Okay, so uh, my project here aims to assess and also map the impact of climate and environmental change for this community. So uh, this includes the, to see the impacts of sea, uh, sea warming, uh, in, sorry, sea warming impacts on the marine resources population and the repartition of this population. So uh, according to the National Institute of Fisheries Science, the sea surface temperature in uh, South Korea has risen for 1.2 uh, Celsius degree between 1968 uh, and 2017, while the world average was about uh, 0.48. So this is very um, rapid increase rate, uh, increasing rate, uh, raising, sorry. Um, and this sea warming uh, caused an influx of new species and also a degradation of the uh, existing underwater habitats. So for example, wild scientists in the 1990s will only see one or two subtropical um, species around South Korea, uh, the Southern Shore. Now, uh, we there is a study that was conducted between 2012 and 2020 that found 85 uh, different kinds of subtropical fishes. So uh, the rise in water temperature um, really threatened the, the, the diversity of native uh, species that are also dropping uh, markedly. And another example would be like uh, the sea around Ulsan used to be uh, very rich in agar agar algae. And while the sea around Jeju Island were full of other sea seaweed like hecho, and the environment has been changing. And now the, um, the, the, the area around Jeju is also full of agar agar. So it, there is a very big shift in the species around the islands. And it's uh, also um, a threatening the um, gulf wheat and brown algae that has been a part of the ecosystem there. And that served as hideout and spawning ground for many fishes. And uh, this um, brown algae is being replaced by hard coral. So this is going to have an impact on the whole uh, eco ecological system. 
Another thing that is important to, um, to note is like climate change uh, caused by the increase of greenhouse gas on the Earth atmosphere not only raised uh, what, uh, the temperature of the ocean, but it also caused acidification everywhere around the world. So this affects the physiolog physiological um, activity, growth and survival of aquatic organism, as well as the saturation of carbonate uh, mineral that could have and that already have a very devastating impact on the shellfish and coral reef. And that can be translated, for example, uh, on the increase of red tides events, which is a harmful algal bloom that have been increasing. So for example, in South Korea, uh, Korean researchers have been reported that between uh, AD 161 to 1820, there were like about 38 events of red tides. However, that number jumped to 1,300 uh, red tides event between 1970 to 2001. So the, uh, the the, the events are really rapidly increasing, and this is also connected to um, uh, sorry to the indus industrialization process and coastal development because uh, more and more uh, toxic and chemical products are being released in the water, so it directly threatens uh, all the marine environments around the shore. So uh, about that, the Henio since they are here and they have been here for centuries, they can really say like, they can really explain how they, the change is becoming more pronounced every year. And this is a particular concern for them as uh, the number also of divers has been uh, dwindling and reducing through uh, the, the years. I see. Uh, thank you very much, Julie. Um, so now we're going to move into the open Q&A session where we would like to open the conversation to the audience. Um, I think while we uh, wait for audience questions to come in, uh, maybe we can go back and uh, I can ask a follow-up question to, to Aisha. Um, Aisha, I'm curious if you have any suggestions for what a meaningful decolonial approach to the study of disasters in the global south might look like. Um, yes, uh, thank you for, um, for giving me that chance to speak about it a little bit. Um, what I have um, increasingly um, been um, kind of struck by or, or been thinking about in terms of um, this this question and the, this work that I've been uh, trying to develop on, um, you know, approaching this in a uh, in a more decolonial way, um, it seems to suggest that it's not really just about giving um, post-colonial uh, citizens, subaltern citizens, um, indigenous peoples, kind of. Um, the, the the platform or the or the space to talk about and to to bring their uh, ways of understanding and their um, their knowledge to to the surface, but really um, uh, in 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 my own kind of thinking and 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 engagement with this subject, I was naive enough to think that um, it's about about bringing these voices to 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 the table, but actually increasingly. Uh, what, what, what's becoming evident is that um, over centuries of kind of the dominance of, of, of Western science, um, we've often lost the, uh, the way to talk about the terms, the um, uh, frames of reference, the, the ability to, um, to, to um, you know, discuss these issues in a way that, uh, that connects with and resonates with um, the the forms of knowledge that that are available, um, and so it's really about reconstructing, um, going against the grain of of dominant thinking, and and, and reconstructing um, a different way to approach hazards, and uh, that's quite challenging and and and, and difficult um, in lots of ways, and 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 makes um, scholars quite. Um, uh, uh, reticent to, to to take on that task, but um, it's definitely one that's um, that 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 that's worth doing, and that we should start um, looking into. Thank you. Um, yeah, so we have a 
a few audience questions here. Um, this one is directed um, particularly towards uh, Aisha and Everjoy. Um, so could you speak to the issue of gender dynamics of community responses to climate hazards, particularly in the context of top-down approaches? Um, if uh, you'd like me to go go first, um, um, I think that um, in a lot of the um, communities that I have um, I have worked in, um, the um, the gender um, question, the gender issue, um, whereas is very very um, uh, powerful and, and and obvious that um, you know women are. Um, being are, are being impacted in 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 very um uneven unequal ways uh it's not necessarily something that's um uh in the in the frame of reference of um you know the the projects that the ngos are are implementing or the um the government um uh particular um uh, schemes that are that are in place. So I think, in some ways, um, to 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 just agree with um, with the, the the statement or the the suggestion uh, made here that even though it's something that communities are dealing with on a day to day basis, it's not necessarily something that that's in the frame of reference of um, the more top down or the more um, uh, formal approaches to uh, or, or projects that are being implemented. Everjoy, did you want to weigh in on um, any gender dynamics that you've seen in your work? Yeah, um, thank you, Aisha, for um, answering that. Um, just to continue, in my um, research area, gender dynamics, this is a big uh, issue. And um, even uh, causing conflict, um, especially in terms of accessing um, information. Um, so I can give an example where um, after the cyclone and um, there was a disaster committee that was set up and it was mainly made of males um, in, in the, from the area. And uh, a lot of women complained that uh, they did not have access to, to this information. So now it was translating now into power dynamics, the one who has uh, information about where to get aid uh, when people are going to be relocated had power. And it put women um, at a very disadvantaged position. Um, and also when it comes to accessing um, mobile phones, um, most of the women I interviewed I, I was just interested and I asked them if they had smartphones and most of them um, say they have just the feature phones and other smartphones and they would rather have um, their first son or the, the male, um, the, their husbands have um, access to that information and then it's passed on to them. And this is tied also to um, the culture in the area, um, but it puts women at a very uh, big disadvantage. And uh, a lot of NGOs who come in uh, want to change that. And they say, we want 70% of our participants to be women. And then this causes further conflicts in the home where males are feeling that, why are we uh, being, um, you're destabilizing our culture, how we do things here. So um, it's it's quite a big topic um, in the area. Actually, if I might jump in, because uh, sure. I think this is also very interesting from the community I work on. This is a very, it's also very interesting because uh, the Henio is an um, ancestral uh, woman community. While in uh, South Korea, uh, you have a very uh, strong uh, conservative uh, Confucianist organization that is really male orientated. And uh, the women have been leading the community for centuries. But however, with the impact of climate change and disaster, um, it's re it's re re sorry redirecting all the roles within the community and while the women were in charge of environmental not say protection but yeah let's say that but it wasn't called that way uh, now they are their role is becoming less and less important within the community and it's disturbing the whole organization of the community well men usually stay at shore and women were providing the food and the incomes that uh, supported the family so uh, it's really rebalancing everything and there is a problem between discourses and um, 
and communication with uh, local authority and national authority that are more male oriented and those communities that used to be led by elderly women. Um, we have another uh, <clears throat> audience question. This one's directed uh, particularly to, uh, to Julian Everjoy. Um, it's, it's on the concept of, of tradition. So Everjoy mentioned tradition as something that's getting in the way of preparedness. Um, Julie, you mentioned tradition more in the context of uh, something to be preserved. Um, and I wonder if uh, both of you can just uh, broadly discuss uh, like dynamic contributions um, that these traditional systems can have uh, mitigating against climate change. Okay, um, I, will, I will go first, <laughs> if that's okay. Um, in, in my area, um, like I mentioned that um, traditional knowledge, um, it's, it's very important um, in addressing climate change um, threats, but a lot of people are, are stuck in, in the old ways. Um, and it's not helping uh, in accepting and assimilating new information. Um, so um, in the area, most people were, were reluctant um, to access new information and actually to implement and understand what is happening. Um, because they say our forefathers have stayed in this area and they have managed um, until today. So we follow the ways that they have um, passed on to us because it's tried and tested. And NGOs come in and they say, you need to, to act immediately. You need to stop um, cutting down trees. You need to stop planting in October and adapt to the changes. And most people are refusing um, because they say the ways that we have been using are, are, are the right, it is the right thing and this is temporary. And we need to appease the, the, the ancestors. So if we have a rainmaking ceremony, things will get better. Um, and a lot of um, people I interviewed, they uh, say that the cyclone was a result of the ancestors being angry because people have lost their ways. So in this way, that's why um, I see it as a, as a big challenge. But there are also a lot of other uh, good things that uh, are traditional, like traditional knowledge is, is contributing to adapting to, to climate change. So when they say do not cut certain trees, when you go um, on this mountain, it's sacred, you don't touch anything to preserve. So the preservation part of tradition also helps to um, maintain and balance the ecosystem. So it's, 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 a, it's a tough one, um, but I really think that um, there is need to balance um, and, and help people understand them, understand their thinking, even though sometimes it might not be scientifically correct and try to move with them in the right direction. Yeah. I guess uh, on the perspective of the community I study, uh, tradition is really embedded in the, um, for the, the passation of knowledge between generation to generation that is building on the experience of the past, but also we can see a gap between uh, older generation and uh, most of the Henyo are now in their 70s or more. And the younger uh, women that try to, um, to follow the, the, the path, but uh, we have an issue like between it's hard work and now people, uh, women are mainly going to the city to get education and it's uh, harder for them to uh, keep living those practices because they are really hard. We don't bring a lot of money, but in the same time, uh, they are trying to recreate links between the older community and the younger one with schools and space that are um, that uh, that try to connect those and the younger generation is also trying to use uh, modern techniques to promote the work of the elders for example you, that by the use of social media so they're really trying to connect although it might work or not work depending on how you uh, you look at it how to connect uh knowledge that has been going that has been passed down through generation uh on the environment and uh, more um, modern techniques from a younger and more dynamic generation. Right, um, we have another question that's directed uh, to all of you, the panelists. Um, can you speak about the use of the word vulnerable and the depiction of people as vulnerable? 
how does it help us understand these dynamics? What does it mask, obscure, or misrepresent? Um, maybe we can start with, uh, with Aisha, if you have any um, thoughts on this question. Um, oh, it's a, uh, it's a long and complicated, um, <laughs> with, with many layers of, um, uh, of uh, yes, of, of politics. Um, actually, um, I've recently contributed um, a, a, sh a short um, chapter in a in a book that asks why vulnerability still matters because um, over the last kind of 10, 20 years, vulnerability or vulnerable seems to have fallen um, out of favor and resilience seems to have been the big, um, big new, um, kind of term and, and all encompassing um, way of thinking about things and resilience has a, a particular kind of neoliberal agenda associated with, you know, people need to come up with ways to be resilient themselves and take a lot more kind of ownership of their own um, uh, uh, vulnerability or resilience and not not kind of depend on on the state and on uh, others to, to 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 help them so that's been the big kind of um uh overarching uh, theme and and vulnerability is kind of fallen out of favor but um particularly where where i kind of sit uh within um development geography or within um uh, the kind of uh, uh, field work and community-based work that I do, I think vulnerability is really important because um, it's it's not just about about seeing things as um, you know uh, about uh, or, or seeing things as connected to economic resources or money. That if you uh, if you have these particular um, you know wealth or um, economic resources, that you're not going to be um, uh, facing the the onslaught of of climate hazards, etc., in the same way. What uh, the reason why I find vulnerability very useful as a concept and as a term is because vulnerability is really multifaceted. It can come from anywhere. So a vulnerability can be social. It's because you belong to a particular social class. Vulnerability, as we just heard, can be gendered. It's because you belong to a particular gender that you are less likely to um, to have access to to to, to a better climate um, uh, adaptation strategies, etc. Vulnerability can be about you know ethnicity, religion, what, what, whatever from from any uh, kind of uh, social political um, uh, avenue. So I think vulnerability is really really um, important and useful, and I think we'll continue to be in these discussions because it helps us to see just. Uh, all the different facets or all the different ways in which uh, people are, are are made really susceptible to, to climate related challenges. Um, yeah. Joy, um, Joy, yeah, did you go ahead? <laughs> yeah, um, um, thank you, Aisha, for uh, simplifying the complicated question. <laughs> um, I think um, I agree with you. Uh, that vulnerability is still a very relevant concept that we should not forget, um, especially in the discussion or um, topic of climate change. And what I have seen in my um, in my field experience is that um, when we look at these different aspects that um, inform how vulnerable a person is um, to climate change, I think they help us to dig deeper and understand the dynamics um, that are at play um, to and distinguish one community from the other, distinguish one person from the other, um, and how they are they are they are affected, and can help us um, to to understand and maybe come up with um, context specific. Um, ideas on how people um, or different societies can address um, different aspects of climate change. 
think I, I'd like to agree on what has been said before. It's really interesting. It's a very interesting and evolving concept that brings together uh, very different fields. It's um, uh, it's multi. It's a multi-layered concept, also multi-scalar. Uh, so it's really fascinating uh, from different perspective how you study it, how this uh, how its definitions have, might have been evolving through time and through regions, and uh, the perception on people that are people or organisms that are uh, so-called vulnerable through through other organisms that might uh, threaten or bring uh, damage to vulnerable systems. So it's very, very interesting. And I also like the um, evolution of vulnerability to resilience and how those concepts can either respond to each other or oppose each other, depending on uh, how you use those. Well, that's just about all the time we have today. Um, thank you to the speakers for your time and contributions to making this a great event. I also want to thank the McGill uh, alumni event team for their help in preparing the event, as well as the Indian Ocean World Center for hosting. Please do check out the Indian Ocean World Center's website, where you can keep updated on future events, including a conference coming up next month on historical and contemporary perspectives on just this question, adaptation and resilience to climate and environmental changes in the Indian Ocean world past the present. And to get more information on the Appraising Risk Partnership, as well as our 10th anniversary. Also, McGill officially kicked off its bicentennial in March last year, and is celebrating its third century with further alumni events, online activities, and much more. You can stay up to date by visiting the McGill alumni website at alumni.mcgill.ca. And these links will be provided in the chat box. Finally, thank you to all of you, our audience, for joining us today and providing such insightful questions. We hope that you learned something from our amazing panel of speakers and please have a wonderful rest of your day. Thank you. <laughs>